Get a read on where things stand and whether a new phase of the war in Ukraine has begun. Then, assessing Pierre Polyev's victory as the new leader of Canada's Conservative Party and the first leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. It's Monday, September 12th, and that's ahead on the agenda. A fast-moving counter-offensive over the weekend saw Ukraine claiming to have recovered almost 3,000 square kilometers of territory previously lost to Russian forces. Does this signify a new phase of the conflict? And after six months of war and sanctions, how has the conflict reshaped Russia? Let's ask. In London, UK, Bill Browder, CEO of Hermitage Capital, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, and author most recently of Freezing Order, a true story of money laundering, murder, and surviving Vladimir Putin's wrath. In Washington, D.C., Angela Stent, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and With the Rest. And in Vail Perkins, Quebec, just north of the Vermont border, there's Jeffrey Kopstein, professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine. And it's great to have you three back on our program tonight, uh, particularly at this most propitious time in what the New York Times is calling a <coughs> new phase in the war. And I think we'll start with, um, Sheldon, why don't you bring the map up? And Angela, maybe you could take us through what you see on this map in terms of the developments that have transpired over the past several days, particularly in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Delighted to be back on your show. So this was very dramatic in the last few days. The Ukrainians have essentially taken most of the area around Kharkiv, which of course is the second largest city in Ukraine, um, and they've taken villages and small towns that were part of the kind of logistics and transportation hub for the Russian troops, uh, making it much more difficult for them uh, to project force, to resupply. Um, and what you've had is, uh, at least what we've seen um, in the images that we have, because journalists are actually not allowed in there, are fleeing Russians. They're leaving all their tanks behind. They're leaving the ammunition behind. Uh, and so this really is quite dramatic. And then there is another offensive going on in Kherson, uh, which was a town that was taken very early uh, in the war when Russia invaded. That is going more slowly, uh, but it is also happening. It's also a key logistical place. So I think what we can say is that what used to be, let's say, two weeks ago, looked like a stalemate, now is much more dynamic. Uh, the Ukrainians are on the offensive. They are being more successful than people thought. The Russians are fleeing, or as the Kremlin says, they're just regrouping their forces. But I think we have to wait and see whether the Ukrainians can t keep the territory that they've taken, what kind of countermeasures the Russians take, including asymmetric responses. Uh, we've already seen them uh, take out much of the power grid in a number of cities around Ukraine until we can say that the Ukrainians have consolidated these gains. But still, it's a very positive sign for the Ukrainians. Well, those are clearly key questions that you've asked at the end there, which makes me want to ask Jeff Kopstein whether you think this is a genuine turning point in the war. Well, it depends what we mean by turning point. I mean, they are um, now six months into a three-day operation, which was supposed to be a blitzkrieg, but it didn't go that way. Then it turned into a war of attrition. So a turning point, the Russians thought the war of attrition would work to their advantage. Um, and this shows that um, it has not. They appear to be, they appear at this point at any rate, to be running, have lost a lot of people, men, um, to lost, have lost, as Angela just said, a lot of material. Um, and that's so that's one turning point you could look at. There's yet another turning point, and that is, and Angela also alluded to it, there was a question, and the Ukrainians were under some pressure to do this, could they actually perform an offensive? And the answer to that, at least preliminarily, appears to be yes. They've gained back some territory. Now, the, the mother of all turning points would be, um, is this somehow Putin's Waterloo? And we don't appear to be there yet. I mean, a Waterloo in the sense of Napoleon losing a decisive battle during the Napoleonic Wars, the, the analogy is apt because Napoleon got so much of his power on the basis of military victory. And Putin himself um, appeared to be, have this kind of strongman and undefeatable image. And if he continues to lose at this rate, it can't but hurt him 
at home. And anybody who's been watching the Russian versions of the agenda, which I've been doing, and I'm sure my co-guests have been doing as well, has seen that things have started to kind of break and change a little bit there in unexpected ways. People like talking heads like us are saying things that they haven't said in a while. Well, that takes me nicely to Bill Browder, and I want to tap into your knowledge of Russia by asking whether you think, I'm going to ask about a turning point, but in a different kind of way. Is this a turning point in terms of Putin's and or the Kremlin's ability to spin this back home as an unadulterated success? Absolutely, it's a turning point. Um, ba basically, <clears throat> as, as um, everyone else has mentioned, um, this was supposed to be a, a three-day war um, which, in which the Ukrainians were going to welcome Russian troops with open arms and hugs. And it's turned out to be uh, a war where, if you believe the Ukrainian numbers, more than 50,000 Russian troops have been killed, huge amount of, uh, of equipment has been destroyed. Um, and now, all of a sudden, uh, the Russian uh, military is on the run. It's, it's, um, it's really been a, 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 a total disaster. And, and it's really interesting. Um, I, I guess there's sort of three three main audiences for this disaster. One is uh, for the Ukrainian people to, to, I mean, this has really improved the morale of the Ukrainian people to see that they could regain this territory. Um, second, um, it's very helpful for the Ukrainians asking for help from the United States government and the European Union and everyone else, because the help that we're providing um, is not being wasted, it's being used very efficiently and very successfully. And then third, and probably most importantly, um, this is demoralizing um, for the Russian public, and, and it's now starting to um, bubble up above the surface. There, <clears throat> um, the the, the uh, main talking heads are now discussing who's to blame, um, and and they're starting to become um, uh, all sorts of little seeds of discontent around Russia. And and a, a lot of people in Russia can tolerate a lot of things, a lot of negative uh, economic repercussions. Uh, uh, a lot of dead bodies, um, but the one thing they can't tolerate is uh, um, losing. And and if if Putin is seen to be a loser, um, they'll take him out in a weekend. And and this is of course just the beginning of of any process that would demonstrate that. But it's it's something that's um, so scary that I, I would imagine Putin is is right now kind of coming coming up with all sorts of retaliations that are going to be very awful and, and uh, um, um, heartbreaking for us to watch going forward because he can't, seem, he can't be seen to be a loser. We will return to this notion of whether this makes Putin much more vulnerable than he has been to date. But just before we get there, Jeff, I do want your, um, I'd like your take on whether, since everybody thought this war was going to be over pretty quickly with a Russian victory, and clearly it now won't be. And not only that, the Ukrainians have demonstrated an ability to take over territory that was theirs, had been taken by Russia, and now they have it back. Does this suggest the war is going to be very long and very drawn out? Well, as Bill just said, um, if things continue going as they are now, it's hard to see Putin staying in power. Um, and much of the, uh, the answer to that question, will this be a long and drawn out war or end quickly, has to do with whether people in Russia decide to end it unilaterally, to say, because it's really up to them. Um, Putin could double down, um, that is, to send in more troops to actually declare this what it is. You're not even allowed in Russia to use the word, this is a war. And that's really what, what changed yesterday on, on television. People started saying, this is a war. This isn't just a special military operation as they've been calling it. Um, and so if they decide to double down, and what would doubling down actually mean? That would mean some kind of general mobilization. And that goes against what Putin has been trying to do. That's to spare the population of much of central Russia, and especially the middle classes and upper classes of Moscow, any sense that they're paying a price for this war. I mean, this weekend, as, as my co-panelists will, 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 will note, there was a huge celebration in Moscow with dancing in the street and music kind of celebrating a giant anniversary of Moscow's existence. Putin's kind of allowing this kind of bread and circuses to go on as other people from outlying areas of, of Russia, especially ethnic minorities, Chechens, are doing the fighting and dying. And so how long he's going to be able to do this will determine whether it's a short 
or a long war. Angela, pick up on that if you would by, and let's point out that it's been six months of sanctions by the West mm -hmm. on Russia. We've got companies that have left Russia. We have, if the Ukrainian estimate is right, 50,000 dead Russians as a result of this war. Uh, and, and some suggestions, at least here in this discussion, that Putin is a lot more vulnerable than perhaps we had initially thought. In your judgment, what's been the impact inside Russia of everything that's transpired over the last six months? Well, it's very interesting. Um, a poll that came out recently by the Levada organization, which is the one independent polling organization, uh, to the extent that one can believe their figures and they themselves say it's problematic during war, but it shows that about 48% of the population by now in Russia are indifferent to the war. They don't support it. They don't actively oppose it. And they're going on living their lives. And just to uh, take up what uh, what Jeffrey was saying, you know, if you live in Moscow, you would barely know that there was a war going on. The restaurants are open. Life goes on as usual. They had the celebration this weekend with a Ferris wheel that then broke down. Uh, but they, they're really not aware of what's happening. And the, the important point, and again, uh, to, to what Jeffrey was saying, that Russia has a huge manpower problem, and yet Putin does not want to do general mobilization because they know, and they can go back to what happened in the Soviet-Afghan war, that once you start recruiting people from the urban middle class educated areas, you're going to have much more active opposition to the war. And therefore, as long as you call it a special military operation and you have you take non-Russians and some Russians from very poor areas and send them there essentially to be cannon fodder, that is the, the opposition isn't going to reach you. So the hawks, by the way, uh, and there are hawks around Putin, and we've seen that even the last few days, are now calling on these same talk shows that have been alluded to for we've got to do general mobilization, we've got to, you know, we have to send more troops. They're now recruiting from prisons um, uh, to send prisoners to the war because they, they just don't have the manpower. So I would say that for a large number of Russians, they don't really feel the war. Um, and for those people who do sign up from the poor areas and who then are killed, their parents get financial compensation when they come back. And so they're aware of the war, but they're being told that they're fighting this noble war against Ukrainian Nazis and against NATO and against the United States. And so far, that propaganda has worked well enough. But I think we could certainly see that changing now if people are more aware of the reverses uh, that Russia has been suffering. And at some point when ordinary people feel the pinch of the sanctions, which they haven't so much yet, and that will happen much more next year when the export controls and things like that um, are fully fledged and the Russians can't get spare parts for things, they're going to have to close down factories, they're not going to be able to manufacture things, people are going to lose their jobs. So I think we have to look if if this war continues as it may well until next year until more people feel the bite well let me follow up with bill browder on that because yes we have heard that the west has been quite unified in its putting sanctions on russia having said that we also hear bill that there have been record revenues for gazprom because of the price of oil so what's happening with the russian economy well, um, I, I don't think the Russian economy is doing um, particularly well at the moment. Um, uh, so this, uh, $350 billion of central bank reserves have been frozen in the West. Um, the oligarchs offshore wealth, 40 of the top 118 oligarchs have had their assets frozen. Um, and uh, and that, that really hurts. But, but as you mentioned, um, oil and gas sales have so far um, carried on going forward. But one, one huge development which took place uh, last week um, is that even though we couldn't convince um, ourselves, and when I say ourselves, I mean the Europeans, to stop buying Russian gas, um, Vladimir Putin decided to um, take matters in his own hand and close the gas pipeline to Europe. So, you know, we could never get our act together to stop sending them money for gas. And so, um, you know, he, he's done it himself. He's self-sanctioned is one of the most important sources of revenue for the Russian government budget. And, and that's huge and that's significant. And, and it looks to me like a, a bit of a, a moment of desperation. That's kind of his last major economic card. If, if, uh, if cutting off the gas supply doesn't crumble the resolve of the European Union, um, uh, then, then he's got nothing else to do. If, you're, if Europe can buy, w make it through the winter and get to the spring, and still not have bought Russian gas, 
then he's lost all his major economic leverage. And so I, I think Putin is really kind of in a, I mean, he, he's showing um, how much everything is hurting him right now. And, and I think he's in a bit of a, of a weak and desperate situation by, by the fact that he's taken such a, a, a dramatic um, step of, of cutting off the gas. Well, if I can quote Game of Thrones, Jeff, winter is coming. And that was a big if that Bill Browder just mentioned. Do you think Europe can get through the winter without Russian gas and stay united on the issue of this war? Well, that's the $64,000 question or $64 billion question, I suppose. Um, you know, I wanted to say one thing about this. One of the hopes with these sanctions, um, and Bill will know this very well, is the hope initially, or at least some people's impression, was that it would hurt the oligarchs and the oligarchs would turn against Putin. The problem with that thinking is that completely misunderstands the way the relationship between wealth and power in Russia. People are not powerful in Russia because they're rich. People are rich because of their proximity to power, right? This is a, a patrimonial regime. It is a regime run by and for Vladimir Putin and his cronies. And so I don't think it, the sanctions were really going to work that way. It's a bit of a waiting game, and there's one other element of this waiting game that I think it's important to throw in there. The Ukrainian economy itself is doing terribly, and they're going to need an awful lot of help. And I think the West is willing to step up with that help. That's why it was so important, that, the, as Bill said, that the Ukrainians could actually pull off some kind of, of offensive, knowing that so that people in the West might actually believe the money's being used for something useful. Um, whether the Europeans are able to survive a cutoff of gas, I think the Germans have been accumulating gas, and they're ready, actually, for winter at this point. The Russians continue to sell petroleum at an even um, increased rate to both China and India, and that, through the back door, that petroleum enters the global markets. So I think things aren't as tight as people think they are, but we don't really know the answer to the question yet of how much leverage do, do the Russians have versus how much um, pent-up reserves do the Europeans have. All right. I want to follow up on the angle uh, with Angela of the oligarchs. And to that end, uh, the Financial mm -hmm. Times wrote a piece called Russia's Melancholy Oligarchs. Let me read you a short snippet from that, Angela, and then get you to comment on it. Here we go, Sheldon. Six months later, there is little sign that the sanctions have pressured the oligarchs into starting a, quote, palace coup against Putin. Instead, they have had a very different impact. Increasingly angry at Western governments, Russia's oligarchs are scrambling for ways to cling on to what remains of their wealth. Many of the oligarchs who once enjoyed spending time in the West are now resigned to returning to Russia. Those in Moscow have quietly accepted their diminished status in a country at war. Okay, how should we understand, Angela, the effect that the sanctions have had on the oligarchs? Well, again, to, to repeat what uh, what Jeff said, um, Pete, if anybody thought that by sanctioning the oligarchs, they were going to get together and say, we have to rid ourselves of this meddlesome priest, we have to get rid of Putin, totally misunderstands the way that power and wealth work in Russia. Now, a number of oligarchs, by the way, have left um, and are now living permanently in Europe. Um, some of them, of course, did talk to the Financial Times. They were they were part of the, the interview there. Some of them in the, in the United States, some elsewhere. But the ones that have remained have understood that they don't have a choice. Uh, there was an interview a couple of months ago with Alexander Lebedev, one of the major uh, oligarchs, also a former KGB person, who said, we don't have a choice. Um, this is our country, and we have to accept that this war is going on. And then, as you say, anger toward the West. Um, and so that, so the sanctions, to some extent, are counterproductive in as much as these oligarchs who enjoyed the ones that are still in Russia and who enjoyed spending time uh, in the West with their homes and their bank accounts and everything else now are, are bitterly resentful that they cannot do that anymore. Um, and they haven't exactly rallied around Putin, but what they've understood is that this is the way it is, that they own what they own because they are part of this circle, not inner circle, but at least a circle around Putin and, and that, that they, you know, they've supported the regime there. Um, and so I think they're certainly not going to be the source of, of, uh, of change in Russia. Really, only one prominent um, 
official from the the Yeltsin era, and he was also played an important role in in Putin's time too. Um, Anatoly Chubais, the father of privatization, he's the only senior official, also a very wealthy man, who's left Russia. Um, he he's not speaking publicly about anything, but he quit. But the rest of them are all there, um, and they're just you know uh, you know resigned to their fate. Well, let me ask Bill that. I mean, the idea presumably was to put pressure on these oligarchs and in the hopes that they would turn on Putin. Maybe perversely, have these sanctions made them more dependent on Putin? Well, I, I agree with uh, Jeff and Angela um, on the idea that there's no chance, no chance whatsoever that the oligarchs would have ever risen up uh, against Putin. <clears throat> but that's not the only logic for sanctioning them. Uh, I think the main logic for sanctioning the oligarchs is that um, their money is is effectively merged with Putin's money. P Putin doesn't hold wealth in his own name. Putin holds wealth in the name of trustees and oligarch trustees. And and so, when when the week after the war started, when when all the governments jointly sanctioned Putin, it was a very satisfying moment. And I, I thought at last he's on a sanctions list. But I also understood, and I think the governments understood that that was more of a symbolic step because if you really want to touch his money and his resources and his access to resources, you have to sanction the oligarchs. And so when we go after these oligarchs, we're effectively going after Putin's money. If you see an oligarch who's worth $20 billion, 10 billion of that belongs to Vladimir Putin. And so um, from that perspective, I think it's been highly effective sanctioning the oligarchs because as Putin gets more and more desperate for money, and he will, because of what he's doing, his own self sanctions with oil and gas and so on, he's not going to have the war chest of the central bank to call on, and he's not going to have the offshore wealth that he's created through the oligarchs uh, to call on, and that's really important because the the um, if if we're not going to engage directly with with Russia um, in uh, helping Ukraine uh, fight this war, then we have to engage indirectly, and the best way we can engage indirectly is to starve him of his financial resources. And the best way of starving him of his financial resources is to make sure that the, the people with the financial resources that he shares don't have access to that. And so I think that from that perspective, it's a very successful operation. And I don't really care whether they support the West or support Russia or support anything. Um, we just don't want them to have the wiring money into Putin to um, use that to buy foreign missiles or whatever he needs to buy in order to continue to kill Ukrainians. Understood. Jeff, I want to get you in here on the issue of the political climate in Russia right now. And I'll mention a couple of examples here, and you tell me what it means. Uh, last week, apparently, Ivan Safronov was sentenced to 22 years in jail for his reporting in 2020. And the independent newspaper Novaya Gazeta was stripped of its print license by a Moscow court, which effectively bans the newspaper. How has the political climate within Russia changed over the past six months, in your judgment? It's become more repressive. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, you people who were um, sort of left alone, like professors, um, several colleagues, um, um, have, e have either been completely silenced or a few very prominent ones have themselves been arrested. Um, media, uh, otherwise very brave media, um, kind of social media people um, who have not just blogs, but, um, um, you know, kind of TV programs on, online. Um, they have also been arrested and are being tried. Um, but, and here's the big but, and maybe my colleagues won't agree with me on this. I don't think it's proper to speak of, of Putin's Russia as totalitarian. Um, it, is, it is repressive. Um, but it's not mobilizational in the sense that Putin doesn't really want to mobilize his population. He just wants them to be to be quiet and go along with all this. Of course, he'd like support, right? But he's not actually trying to uh, construct a kind of a Stalinist communist version of what what, what had existed before. So I think there's no doubt that it's become more repressive and a less pleasant place to live. In fact, I was just in, in Israel for two months, and I was, I was in a Hebrew course, in fact, and there were lots of Russians, very young Russians, in that Hebrew course, trying to actually learn Hebrew in the high tech, in the high tech sector, right, who have left not because they have any great love or any kind of some Zionist ideal, but they've left because they want to have a, a life of relative freedom from oppression. So there's no doubt that the system has become more repressive 
over the last six months. Well, let me get Angela to weigh in on that, not, not on your learning Hebrew, but rather on whether or not, uh, which if you have learned it, that, we're very impressed. That's a hard language to learn. Maybe, Angela, you could tell us what do you think Russia is moving, in fact, from an authoritarian country to a totalitarian country? So I agree with Jeff. <clears throat> it is an authoritarian country. It's become more repressive under Putin. Um, elements now in Russia resemble what it was like in the Brezhnev era. Uh, you know, I was a graduate student in the Soviet Union during the Brezhnev era, and I remember all the things about if you want to have a conversation with someone, you have to do it outside. Uh, you know, you you know that someone's probably going to report be reporting on what you're doing. All those kinds of things, and and jailing people for expressing uh, opposition to the government. That's all there. But it doesn't have an ideology. And as Jeff said, they're not trying to mobilize people. They're trying to do the opposite. They want everyone just to enjoy their Moscow life or wherever they live, you know, go to cafes, have fun and just forget what's happening. Uh, and the other major difference to the Soviet period is you can leave Russia. Uh, Jeff, Jeff talked about the people who are now in Israel. 400,000 Russians, estimate, have left since the war began. Putin doesn't even want them there. He has said very sarcastic and derogatory things about business people, Russian business people who've left. Uh, you know, they're traitors, let them go. So that's the safety valve. Uh, if you really don't like it, you can leave. But if you stay, then you really do have to conform. And so for the people who stay and still try and oppose the war, it's getting more and more dangerous. Uh, they're being jailed. Um, I, I have a colleague who finally managed to get out because she knew she was going to be arrested uh, the next day. She's now in the United States. I mean, there. So, so the repression is certainly great. The authoritarianism is worse, um, but it's not a totalitarian state. Bill, what's your sense about how much support there actually is inside Russia for this war against Ukraine? Well, I think this is the um, the reason why Putin went to war in the first place. I mean, he, he's he's been uh, uh, stealing money from from the Russian people for 22 years. He and and the thousand people around him have stolen, um, I estimate, a trillion dollars from the Russian state over a 22 year period. That's a thousand billion dollars, and. Um, uh, and that's money that should have been spent on hospitals and schools and roads and so on. And sent, instead was spent on villas and yachts in the south of France and private jets and so on. And that was an unsustainable situation. You can't do that um, in a country the size of Russia with a population the size of Russia into perpetuity and, and, and to not expect that the people would rise up against you at some point. And so in, in, in my opinion, the reason why Putin went to war is not the sort of standard um, explanations of NATO and and uh, a Russian Empire. I think he went to war because he was afraid that there was going to be a, a, a match lit on dry tinder, which is the discontent of the people. And he one day over a seven you know a seven day period of time, a million people would be marching on Red Square, and he would be hung from a lamppost. I think that was his big fear. And what does a dictator do if they're afraid of the people rising up against them? You create a foreign enemy. And um, I, I mean, I don't think that Russia even had a beef with Ukraine. He created it. He, he manufactured this fake conflict and then started a war over this fake conflict. And it worked. His, his approval ratings are, are very high. This was kind of like George Bush after Afghanistan, after September 11th, invading, Af going into Afghanistan and his approval ratings went through the roof. This is the same type of thing. People ra have rallied around. Putin rallied around um, a strong leader, rallied around a foreign uh, against a foreign enemy, um, and so I believe that in the short term it worked. And, and the byproduct of starting a war is that he could go and get rid of all all critical media, all foreign media, all social media. There's no more Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and so he's 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 I, I don't know whether you call it totalitarian, authoritarian, but what I would call is is there's a a, a, a huge um, tendency towards total control, and and I uh, I have friends who are in jail right now um, for just calling the war a war, um, and and everybody I know I, I I don't know anybody who's left in Russia because everybody I know has had to leave because they're too scared to stay there, and these are people who have made their whole lives in Russia, and so um, he he has he has done what uh, what he needed to do to create this this 83% uh, approval rating and, and gotten rid of anybody who's critical. And, and from that perspective, it's kind of working out well for him. The, the question is what happens next? 
Hmm. In which case, Jeff, even if the war is not going as well as he'd hoped, is he more powerful today than he was six months ago? Well, we can't really measure his power in institutional terms, right? He doesn't subject himself to a vote or anything like that. The question is, what kind of leader, what kind of system they actually have? And and here, I don't think you can actually, here, let me pose, pose something. I don't think that there is one institution in Russia today, not one, that you could say would survive for, with certainty, Putin's demise. What Putin's Russia is, is Putin and his cronies. It's a kind of a mafia state. And the world that Putin wants, right, um, is a world, the relations that he wants with Ukraine, you have to look no farther than Belarus. Think of it as Don Corleone, the mafia, sitting around the table talking about how they're going to chop things up. And that's the way he would have liked it with the rest of the world. And it all appeared to be, I mean, including with Donald Trump, um, that's what the kind of relations he wanted. It appeared to be working for a long time because of high petroleum prices and because he, through a lot of force, um, um, calmed down what was a kind of a crisis in Russia in the late 90s and early 2000s. That will only work as long as he has the goodies to pass around and the repressive apparatus at hand. The minute those two conditions are no longer, no longer obtained, he'll fall from power. And so that's my answer to your question. Okay, I got a minute left for Angela to tell me, and that was a provocative expression, Jeffrey, a mafia state. Angela, do you sign on to that, that it's a mafia state, Russia today? Yes, it is largely a mafia state. Uh, I mean, the, the question is that for people like Putin, we can argue about what's more important, the power or the wealth, but the wealth has been a means to power and the power a means to wealth. It is. Um, and, and that's why, you know, people who don't want to exacerbate things or escalate tensions with Russia should recognize what they're dealing with. Um, and, and this is a state that runs by very different rules than we do. And it is, as Jeffrey said, a highly personalistic system. Institutions really don't count at all. Uh, and it's just, you know, one man surrounded by a group of other people that keep this going. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views so eloquently with us. Jeff Kopstein from the University of California, Irvine. Angela Stent from the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Her book, there it is in the background of the shot, or it was a second ago anyway. Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest. Bill Browder, CEO, Hermitage Capital from London, U.K., Freezing Order, his latest submission on what's going on over there these days. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. While it was really no surprise this weekend when Pierre Polyev won the leadership of the Conservative Party, the extent of that victory sure was. It wasn't even close, as Polyev took 68% of the points on the first and only ballot. With us for some perspective on the weekend and what comes next, let's welcome Ginny Roth, Vice President, National Practice Lead for Government Relations at Crestview Strategy. She was Director of Communications on the Polyev campaign. And Andrew Coyne is here. He's the columnist, of course, for The Globe and Mail. And it's nice to see you, too, after having seen you in Ottawa this past weekend for one of the least interesting leadership <laughs> conventions I can ever recall. Okay, full, full bias on the table right away. Don't you miss delegated conventions? Come on, be honest. I mean, well, I don't. Theatrical standpoint. Yes, yeah. agreed, agreed. Better for TV. Well, here's what it looked like. Sheldon, you want to bring these numbers up here? Here's this, what the stat board had to say. Polyev, as we suggest, winning 68.15% of the votes on the first ballot, of the points, rather. Jean Charest, who was supposed to be the prime challenger, only 16%, well back. Leslin Lewis, a little below 10%. Roman Babber, a little over 5% of the points. Scott Aitchison, a little over 1% of the points. Many people, Ginny, to you first saw this leadership race as a kind of a fight for the soul of the Conservative Party of Canada. If it was, what does that result tell us? That it wasn't. <laughs> um, you know, I think the Conservative Party, any political party when it loses a leader, is uh, on a bit of a quest to sort out what it wants to be. And the biggest question for everyone is how to win. Um, and so it was certainly a, that, was, that was certainly the question. What do we want to be and, and uh, what do we need to win? Uh, and the answer was really clear. 
Um, you know, I think I think it, it, it's evident from the results that the vast majority of people who uh, are steadfast members, who sort of keep their membership ship up all you know through the de through the years and the decades, and the new members, the people who are exploring the party for the first time or who've left the party and come back, um, definitively, the vast majority of them um, all feel the same way about what they want. And we can get into that, uh, but but I think the battle over the soul of the party was a bit overdone as a narrative, and it turns out not to have been much of a battle. Andrew, what do you say? Uh, it was a very clear result in the sense that Poyevra won smashingly. Uh, it's not so clear what that means, other than that they want to be the party of Pierre Poilievre. They want to be a party that is um, unashamedly pugnacious, that is not apologizing for itself, that feels good about itself. And that is certainly one of Polyev's strengths, is he doesn't back down. He, he, and that's a strength in politics generally, is if, if you feel like you, you look like you're confident in yourself. Um, the question is, what's the actual content there? Um, conservatism in Canada has become, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, sort of performative. It's not a lot of substance to it. You look, this was a lot of conservatives' complaints at the end of the Harper era was, yeah, we were in power. What did we actually accomplish? How did we actually move Canada in a more conservative direction? Harper had a reputation for being very conservative, not because of what he did, but because he was pugnacious and he fought liberals and he made liberals angry. Uh, Paul Yever is very much in that uh, vein, but he didn't actually run on a really much of a substantive policy platform in that direction. I don't know if either of you have read Tasha Carradine's book, uh, The Right Path in which she suggests that, uh, that the pulley of approach to politics is actually not the way to win a general election. Might win you a leadership convention, it won't win you a general election. And she sort of divides conservatives into convoy conservatives, of which Polyev is clearly the champion, and what she calls club conservatives, who are more the moderate, pragmatic red Tories who hang out at the Albany Club and, you know, have this kind of establishment tinge to them. Uh, if you're a club, I mean, clearly the convoy conservatives are in ascension here. If you're a club conservative, is there still a place for you in this party? I don't think there are a lot of club conservatives left. Um, and, and that's okay, you know? I mean, they're getting older, uh, and private members' clubs are not as popular as they once were. Uh, the types of people who um, came out to all events, I think, uh, in the leadership race, not just Pierre Polyev's, um, Roman Babbers as well, and Les and Lewis's, uh, they were all different kinds of Canadians all across the country. And in many cases, uh, in, for, for Polyev's events, they came out in the thousands. Um, many of them erring on the younger side uh, as a sort of average age of the types of people who might want to make time in their day to, to go to a political event. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm willing to bet that none of them are members of private members' clubs. And I don't think that's the worst thing, because I don't think most Canadians are members of private members' clubs. Well, that's a little and, narrow. And I mean, she, I see what she, you mean she goes on, on beyond ideology. It. Sure. Yeah. But, but, but I think that's also true. I think there are not a lot of people left who describe themselves as red Tories. That's not to say there aren't a lot of people who would consider voting conservative who describe themselves as moderate, mm. um, who are sort of mainstream and not hard right ideologues. But I think a lot of those people voted for Pierre Polyev. Um, I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of people who, who stepped up and, and put his name first on their ballot. Um, I don't think that many people are describing themselves as deep blue, hard right partisans. I think that's unlikely. I think there's another category p potentially between convoy conservatives and club conservatives, and that's conservative conservatives. <laughs> I mean, people talk about is there a place for the red Tories in this party? I want to know is there a place for the blue Tories? Is there a place for people who actually believe in conservatism, in smaller government, lower taxes, well, he's for limited that. government. Well, is he, what's he actually talked about during this campaign? He's talked about the convoy. He's talked about vaccine mandates. He's talked about firing the Bank of Canada governor. He's talked about you know a lot of things that don't really have a lot to do with substantive policy terms, but can get people really excited in the base because he's again he's owning the libs. He's fighting it back. Well, you saw his victory speech. Yeah. He mentioned lower taxes in the victory speech. Yeah. Right. He mentioned less government yeah. in the victory speech. He, he mentioned them. I'm, I'm just saying what. What did he actually spell out about what he would do? I, I, I will give him credit for one thing. He has talked about he's going to appoint a commission, uh, which we used to laugh at as being vague, but it's the most specific thing he said during the campaign is he's going to appoint a commission to come back and report on tax reform. Tax reform is desperately needed. I hope we'll hear more about that. But this was, as I say, this, this, is, this, is, this is not about, there's, there's no, no such thing really as polyevrism as, as an ideology. It's more a disposition. It's a stance. It's, it's for people who feel like they've been talked down to and pushed around, and he comes around and he says, I'm going to fight for you. Now, that's, that's part of politics. No, I get but that. But you just wish there was a bit more there there. I get that, and he is clearly the champion of that group. Yeah. But 
again, Tasha Kerrigan was here last week, and I see it with my own eyes. There are people in this country who are moderate, pragmatic, <coughs> middle of the road, yeah. what you might have called back in the day red Tories, but maybe they're not. Maybe a lot of them are blue Tories as well. I went through riding by riding after that convention was over. Yeah. There's 338 ridings in the country, and Polyev won 330 of them. Yeah. Charest won eight. Yeah. Is there still a, I'm going to ask it again, is there a place for moderate, pragmatic conservatives in this party so, under his leadership? Let's talk about the people who, these people that he attracted, who I think many are talking about grievance politics and they're angry. Um, they came, they, you know, he would do these rallies and he would stay for hours after the fact, sometimes till 1 or 2 a.m. And he would talk to every single one of them that was interested, which were a lot of them. And the things they brought up were uh, inflation. And they would say just inflation because, uh, you know, he's a strong politician and so he branded inflation uh, based on the guy who he thinks is the cause of it. Um, and they would say, I think this guy's going to uh, bring down inflation by shrinking the size of government. Uh, they would bring up free speech uh, and they would say they have a problem with some of the, uh, the bills uh, before, before Parliament or that, or that have been passed by the Liberals that they think restrict free speech, which I know Andrew has a problem with some of those as well. Um, so, so these are people talking about really specific policy commitments. Uh, that Pierre Polyev has made. And in many cases, they're saying, I voted Liberal in 2015, uh, and I'm not interested anymore, or, or I voted NDP the last time around, uh, or I voted when I was younger, and I've just given politics a break for a while because I think no one's spoken for me. These are not people who define themselves as on an ideological spectrum. They're defined by the fact they can't fill their car tank with gas. Uh, they think government's gotten too big, and they want government to leave them alone, uh, and, th and it's telling them what to do. And, and so you can say that, um, you know, in some ways, I think Polly is punished for being a strong communicator because it means that therefore there must be no substance. Well, I think part of why he's a strong communicator is because he's, he's talking to people about uh, inflation and lower taxes and smaller government and there's substance to it. It's, it's, there's policy behind it, um, but because he's a strong communicator, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's reported on as a message that, that is really compelling to people. You know, pragmatism is the flip side of that is opportunism. And so I do actually think pragmatic Tories have a place in this party because what you're going to see, I think, from Pierre Poivre is a lot of the same things you saw from Stephen Harper, a lot of the same people around him. So I think you'll see a lot of the same kind of micro-targeting of policies to particular demographics they're trying to reach. Uh, it will not have, I don't think, a real... And people who think that they're going to get a really strong, robust small state conservatives from, from Peter Poliever, I think may be disappointed. But I think what you're going to see is, is much more tactical. What you will see certainly though is there's not going to be any division in the party in the sense of the, there's no real regional divide except perhaps with some Quebec MPs, but he won all their ridings. Uh, and you're not going to... He's got gonna, a pretty French-sounding last name, that's too. That's right. And there's nobody there, who, there's nobody who's going to lead any kind of opposition to within the party. So he's kind of nuked any potential. I think the greater danger is you're going to have a bunch of people sitting on their hands who aren't particularly enamored of his style of politics, who won't work, go out and be activists for him, and who won't vote for him. So the people, there's certainly a lot of people who, are, who would be desperate to vote against the Liberals, who've been waiting for a Conservative Party that could deliver them from the Liberals. And is he the option they're looking who for? Who will stay with the Liberals. And there'll mm -hmm. be a certain proportion of Tories, uh, Tory voters, who will either sit home or vote for the Liberals. Well, here he was, Saturday night, 8 p.m., the winning speech. Sheldon, roll it if you would. They don't need a government that sneers at them, looks down on them, calls them names. They don't need a government to run their lives. They need a government that can run a passport office. They need a prime minister who hears them and offers them hope that they can again afford to buy a home, a car, pay their bills, afford food, have a secure retirement, and God forbid, even achieve their dreams if they work hard. They need a prime minister who will restore that hope, and I will be that prime minister. I, I got to hand it to him. He is a great speaker, and he is, I mean, he, <laughs> the camera likes him. He knows how to perform. He's got the snappy statements. Apropos of Andrew's question, though, how much is behind all of that snappiness? I, I think there's a lot. Um, he made a lot of a policy announcements throughout the campaign um, that ladder up to similar themes, reducing the size of cost in government, getting government out of your way, whether it's policing your speech um, or policing how many vaccines you have to have in order to keep your job. Um, 
uh, you know, we talked about a pay-as-you-go act that for every new dollar spent in government, the government would have to reduce it. Um, there, there was all, we talked about tax reform. There were all kinds of policy commitments he made. Um, he talked about, I mean, we haven't even talked about gatekeepers yet. One of the other big themes is this idea that uh, Canada can't do anything anymore or build anything anymore because there are all these ridiculous gatekeepers in the way. And if you're a young person who doesn't think of yourself as a liberal or a conservative or maybe you're going to switch your vote because you're a switcher, according to a pollster, no, you just can't afford a house. And you're 35, and you don't understand why. And you, you know, the more you read about it, the more you realize it's because houses aren't being built. There are nowhere near enough of them. Um, and, well, and so, so I mean, that's pretty that's pretty policy laden, and it's pretty moderate. Well, let me pick up on this because uh, here's uh, sorry to read the competition here, but here's Chris Selly from the National Post <laughs> writing yesterday. Okay, Sheldon, let's go with this. The knocks against Polly Ever mostly not about his policies, but his applause lines. Fire the governor of the Bank of Canada. Down with the globalist conspirators of the WEF, and rightly so. What policy he does have, though, is old-time conservative religion. Smaller government, getting our natural resources to market, more individual freedom in our personal and professional lives, ending the liberals' laughable efforts to censor the Internet, defunding the CBC, and ending media bailouts. Fiscal restraint after a long period without much of it. Now that sounds like a bit of a mission statement, don't you think? The, 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 the slogans are there, the, the buzzwords are there, the policy substance is not. So, you know, Ginny listed some of the things he said, and that was more or less the sum total of what he said, and it wasn't that much. Uh, so, yeah, you can, you can I say the most substantive thing was tax reform, and that was on all appointed commission. He said nothing about where, where he would cut spending. He has no actual um, co coherent critique of the Bank of Canada. All he says is we shouldn't have this inflation that every other country has. He has not said, okay, would you, what would you have done during the pandemic thing? Would you have not have helped people with the, the, the amount of spending the government did during the pandemic, when, when the, during the lockdown, when everything was shut down? Uh, if you did have all that spending, would you not? Would you simply have let interest rates rise? You know, without the Bank of Canada buying up those bonds. He's not really uh, addressed any of that, and he certainly hasn't said what he'd do different now. He just says, well, interest rates are going up, and it's all because, you know, this is not actual policy substance. It's just kind of mouthing buzzwords. Now, the speech was good in the sense that it focused on the economy, so at least he's focusing on the theme, and I think it's a much more a coherent theme for him if you're going into a general election than to be talking about the World Economic Forum and, and, and vaccine mandates, which will be old news by the time the election rolls around. But uh, uh, it will depend in part on what happens with the economy. If the economy really goes in the tank, he probably won't have to deal a lot of substance because people will be so angry at the government they just want to throw them out anyway. Mm -hmm. And that may be his calculation. But mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 he's, it, it's fair for him to have that strategy, but it's fair for the rest of us to point it out. After his victory, Jenny, everyone was talking unity, right? which they usually do after conventions, if you're lucky. Uh, here's what Marjorie LeBreton had to say back in June. She said, I, and this is a former conservative activist, worked for Brian Mulroney, senator, I really fear that the great accommodation that was uh, reached between Stephen Harper and Peter McKay in the fall of 2003 is fracturing beyond repair. What do you think? I mean, that's what she said about Stephen Harper, too, quite literally. Uh, and then, and then you know, she joined his government in a really prominent role. So. Look, also I should say, as part of that great bargain, uh, Peter McKay and the PCs argued for a point system. Which they got. Our, which they got, mm -hmm. and which uh, vastly favored uh, Pierre Polyev in this race. Mm -hmm. So the very system that was meant to um, make sure that any leader had appeal across the country from out west to out east um, in you know, parts of the country that were the most populated so that you wouldn't be able to just sell a bunch of memberships in Calgary, which is what everyone thought Pierre Polyev would do. No, no, he dominated that point system, mm -hmm. the, the um, symbol of exactly what she's talking about. And so, um, you know, I think she may miss the era of club conservatives, but I think millions of Canadians just do not. And not only that, they don't even identify it with it. Well, follow up with this, because he wrote the other day that the government of the day is, I think the expression was, ripe for the plucking. That's a good one. The conventional wisdom has been that Jean Charest might have been a better leader for those who are, you know, anxious to get rid of the liberals, and he's a sort of a moderate Tory that they can wrap their arms around, mm -hmm. whereas Polyev scares the hell out of people who want to defect from the liberals, and therefore his victory ensures that those people will go home to the liberal party. Can you speak to that? I mean, I think that characterization is defined too often by conservatives who only talk to liberals. Uh, and, and it's, you know, there's this phenomenon of uh, you think you should vote for every liberal's favorite conservative. Well, those liberals are, are going to keep voting liberal, right? And, and often those people, I think, don't talk to the types of people who came out to Pierre Polyev's rallies, many of whom were not partisans 
or even vote switchers who identify as liberal or conservative. They're just regular people, many of whom vote less frequently or their vote jumps all over the place depending on what their concern is that week uh, because they're preoccupied not with where someone sits on the ideological spectrum but with whether they can afford milk, uh, mm -hmm. whether they can afford the gas their car and who is speaking to them on, on the issues that matter to them most. Uh, and so I think it's easy to get distracted by that strategy uh, and I, I, I just think it's built on something that doesn't really exist. Do you think the party made a mistake picking him? We shall see. Um, they've made a bet, let's put it that way. I just want to address Marjorie's point just very sure. briefly. This isn't that party that she was talking about. That party was 20 years ago. There were, there's now 670,000 members as, as of election day, leadership election day, 500,000 of whom, you know, came in in the course of this campaign, right? They were new signups. So it's a very different party than it was in, in the past. Um, they've made a bet that they don't need to go for the center voter. Um, and this is an eternal debate in the Conservative Party. Do you, do you win by winding up the base and getting them excited and winning on turnout, or do you win by reaching across and trying to get centrist voters to <clears throat> come across? Do you win by expanding the base? Uh, they've run this experiment a couple of times. You know, 2019 was a turnout the base vote and they didn't win. And then 2021, they tried to expand the base for the first half of the campaign and they were winning, and then it's, it imploded yeah. on itself because of the internal contradictions. In fairness, they got the most votes in both of those elections. That's right, but, but the trouble is it's not well distributed. Right. And what they've done in this, with this choice and, and the types of approach that they're taking is they're going to do very, very well once again in Western Canada. They're going to win 80% majorities in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. Are they going to win the suburban Toronto vote? Are they going to win in Quebec? Are they going to win amongst women? Uh, that, I think, remains to be seen. But they, the calculation is we can not only wind up the base, we can get those People's Party voters to come back to us, and we can turn out people who've never voted before, the kinds of people who signed up during the course of this mm -hmm. leadership campaign. It's a big bet. Uh, it's a risky one. We'll see. Yeah, let, let's talk about I kind of reject the premise that every voter can be placed on a spectrum, from PPC on the far right to NDP on the far left, and that everyone's just, in, you know, you're, you're picking and choosing voters from this place on the spectrum. Um, and, and we should talk about these regions that matter, right? I mean. Windsor, Ontario, for instance, or um, uh, Vancouver Island in BC. I mean, these are places where um, Pierre Polyev did very well. Uh, he had incredible turn at his rallies, in many cases from people who were unidentifiable on the spectrum. Um, and we know that uh, Doug Ford's a very good example in Ontario of uh, a conservative who can win if they sort of reject the premise of that spectrum mm -hmm. uh, because they speak to types of people who have types of concerns, workers, um, young people who can't afford housing, and uh, who don't put themselves on that spectrum. And so will some of those people who be, be people who voted PPC last, last time? Yes, absolutely. I think many of them will be people who voted Liberal last time, too. I, I agree with Jenny that most voters aren't that ideological, but they're also not purely based on on policy and what it means to me either. They're also looking at the leader in a big way. Mm -hmm. And some voters get very excited by a leader who's very hot and very angry and turns up the temperature. A lot of voters are repelled by that. A lot of voters are moderates in the sense that what they're looking for is moderation of temperament. They're looking, mm -hmm. do you have good judgment? Um, you know, lining up with the convoy protesters, uh, telling people to get into Bitcoin because it'll hedge against inflation, these are not, these do not bespeak mature judgment. And I think for that kind of moderate voter, uh, he's, got a, he's got a hard sell ahead of him. Does he lack judgment in as much as conservatives, I always thought, stood for law and order, and he was pretty clearly with the convoy, which at the end of the day was not about much law and order? Uh, I think he was at, uh, with the convoy for the same reason <laughs> that I think the one poll showed that a third of Canadians... Um, felt empathy for people who were protesting uh, because they felt like the government had, uh, governments of all levels had just cracked down on freedom in a way that was totally unnecessary and hadn't looked at the harms caused by some of the COVID restrictions. Um, and I think that that was a, a risky move for him that paid off because it showed that he was willing not to take the safe option in a given moment, but to assess what was going on and assess through his own lens of what he thinks is important, freedom um, uh, primarily. Uh, and he made a choice that I think that I think um, people will remember in a positive way. Um, you know, as to as to his sort of judgment and temperament. Um, this is a pretty thoughtful guy, and I think we should assess the way he's going to communicate with Canadians um, based on uh, the speech that you played. I think that was a really strong example of where you're going to see his message and communications go. He okay. we got a couple of minutes left here, and uh, let's talk climate change here. I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons the Conservatives did not have a central Canadian breakthrough in the last two elections is because the biggest chunk of the electorate in Quebec and Ontario decided that the party had virtually nothing 
of importance to say about climate change. Does Pierre Polyev have anything important to say about climate change that you think could ameliorate that situation for the party? Not at the moment. Uh, he's talked vaguely about you know, the way that many conservative politicians do of we're going to emphasize technology rather than taxes, which again is a slogan, not a policy. Um, he certainly appeals to people who don't think that we need to do anything about climate change. Uh, and it certainly is in line with the, with, uh, the conservative approach to date, for, for the most part, which has been we don't want to use pricing to, to reduce uh, carbon emissions, even though that's absolutely the lowest cost, most efficient way of doing it. We want to use a lot of other things that are way more costly, but where the costs are hidden from people and therefore won't be as politically costly to us. Mm -hmm. He seems to be very much in that vein. What I will say is, if we're into a recession in the next couple of years, it may be that people won't be as concerned about climate change as they were in the past. Has he had anything relevant to say about climate change during this campaign? Um, well, I think he has, because I think what's relevant to, for most Canadians about climate change is that they take it seriously and they want a leader who takes it seriously. Seriously, uh, but they don't want, in the name of cli climate change, to be penalized to the point where it affects their ability to afford their everyday lives. Um, and a consumer-facing price on carbon, um, pretty pretty definitively, is not something he's going to support, and it's not something a lot of Canadians support. If it means um, that they can also uh, feel like they, that, that the government's doing something about climate change. Um, so, look, he's talked about getting our, our uh, energy resources to market in a global marketplace where um, really heavy emitters who could care less about climate change as countries are supplying much of the world's power right now in energy um, uh, at a time when it's scarce. Um, meanwhile, Canadian uh, resources are sort of, in many cases, sitting in the ground uh, because of decisions the government's made. So um, I think that it's, it's a big conversation. There are global global events that are happening, not, not just inflation, but um, insecurity and geopolitics that will factor into people's balance on climate change, taking it seriously, but also uh, making smart choices for Canada. And I think he will find a message and a path that appeals to a lot of Canadians. I think for what it's worth, we have the two finest campaigners in the country leading the two biggest parties in the country right now, which sets up a titanic battle in the next election campaign. This should be one for the history books. Thank you, Andrew Coyne, Jenny Roth, for coming into TVO tonight. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, September 12, 2022. Tomorrow, what a new king means for Canada. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. TVO.org has a new look online. For the latest Ontario current affairs from our digital team, from the agenda, of course, and for all of our podcast documentaries and programs, check out the slick new website at TVO.org.